Thank you. I can see people joining. We will start the session shortly. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, tax fans, depending on where you are located. And welcome to the third session of our Global Indirect Taxes event series. Today, we will host an interactive virtual session, and we're not alone. I'm happy to share with you that many people from all over the world have registered for today's event. This series of events will help you and your organization navigate the significant changes that have been made to indirect taxes globally and provide an overview of technical and commercial considerations across all key tax jurisdictions. The webinars will also cover the concept of an establishment from a VAT and indirect tax perspective and customs duties. Please take a few minutes to read through the disclaimer for this event. We truly look forward to all of your questions and comments. You can do so by using the Q&A box on your toolbar at the bottom of your screen. Even if you cannot see the questions, the host can see them. Due to time restrictions, our presenters will do their utmost best to respond to all questions received during the event. We will also conduct a short survey at the end of the event, which will be anonymous, by the way. We would appreciate your honest feedback as this enables us to improve our virtual event offering to you. The survey will automatically pop on your screen after the session ended and will take less than two minutes to complete. By way of introduction, my name is Stefan de Keulaar. I'm PKF International's tax, tax Director and I'm based in Belgium. And I'm joined throughout the series by Luigi Lungarella, who leads PKF International's Indirect Tax Pillar and who is a member of the International Tax Committee. Without any further ado, I will give the stage to our first presenter, Luigi Lungarella. Grazie. Uh, grazie, Stefan, and, um, and a big thank you to the rest of the uh, PKF International Indirect Taxes Group. And I, I happen to be one of the founding members of the group and I'm very proud to be leading a uh, team of experienced practitioners located in uh, just under 500 offices in, uh, in over 150 countries. And, and this series of events is a number of members of our indirect taxes team providing you with some useful tips that all of you can adopt within your organization. And, and chances are that you might be able to adopt these measures wherever you might be based as these are mainly dependent on where your clients are located or where your clients are enjoying the services that you're providing as opposed to where you are based. So we mentioned how this series of events has, um, has seen a few contributors from, uh, from around the world. For example, during our two previous webinars that we held in early October and in early December, I was joined by members of the Indirect Taxes Pillar based in New York, based in uh, Moscow, based in Paris, in Amsterdam, and in London. And by the way, if you haven't done so, you can watch the recordings of both webinars on pkf.com. And today, we'll be building on our global approach by involving authoritative practitioners from PKF firms in France, in Singapore, and in the United States, including uh, Ralph Rudenberg, a partner at uh, PKF of Conor Davis in, um, in New York, an oracle in uh, US sales taxes with over 20 years international experience gathered between Europe and, um, and in Germany to be precise, and in the US. We will also involve Boon Hyong Go, uh, tax director at uh, PKF CAP in Singapore with almost 30 years experience in both direct and indirect taxes gathered both in-house and within practice. And last but not least, Stephen Dell from uh, Hedios in Paris, the walking encyclopedia of uh, European VAT. Stephen lectures at three universities in France on indirect taxation. He's also the president of the International VAT Association, a member of the EU Commission's VAT expert group and a member 
of the OECD's Technical Advisory Group on Consumption Taxes. And Stephen is also one of the authors of uh, VAT in the EU, a prominent country by country guide covering all 27 member states and the UK, which has been published by Tolis Lexis Nexis. And one of the topics covered in quite some detail within this publication is the taxation of e-services, together with the key distinction with the taxation of non-digital services. The publication also covers um, what are the factors that you need to take into consideration when distinguishing between the two, how the use and enjoyment provisions can affect taxpayers providing cross-border services and the extension of the destination principle beyond electronically supplied services. And the publication also covers the greatest majority of the topics that we're going to be illustrating later on today, as well as um, also a topic that is very much, that is very much interlinked with any cross-border services consideration. That is why it is actually also important to, to consider these in its own right. And that is why Stephen and I, together with uh, Jan Saunders, will provide a full in-depth session on the servitization of the economy and the interrelation between a direct tax P and a VAT fixed establishment. And that will be held on Wednesday, the 6th of April. And matters can get rather complicated and, uh, and even some basic definitions such as, for example, what constitutes any service can spark quite a lot of debate and can be interpreted in different ways in different jurisdictions. So it is obvious that a global approach is often required when analyzing our clients, um, how to minimize risk and maximize opportunities for them. And that is why it is also so important to work closely with colleagues such as Bourne, colleagues such as Ralph and such as Stephen, who spend the greatest amount of the time helping businesses trading uh, internationally. And businesses trading internationally, and in particular within Europe, and especially in e-commerce, have real problems in relation to VAT. But any business involved in e-commerce should not solely focus on European VAT matters, but also on considerations affecting VAT in non-European jurisdictions, as well as alternative indirect taxes, such as GST and such as sales taxes across the world. And this is because indirect taxes globally are seen by, by governments as a, as a relatively stable source of tax revenue. And we need to, of course, bear in mind that there is an increasing development of e-commerce measures, which have been proposed at OECD level and adopted nationally to ensure that indirect taxes are collected when due. And this has led to a constant increase on the number of countries that are imposing VAT or GST on non-resident providers of digital services, which covers sales to consumers of all sorts of things, such as, uh, such as apps, such as e-learning, such as uh, streaming media, advertising, um, dating sites, uh, gaming, and, and some countries also include telecoms and uh, broadcasting services. And we will showcase this to you rather, rather visually, utilizing maps of the various continents. But, but beforehand, it is probably best to take, to take a little step back and to consider why indirect taxes are being deployed to commerce. Thanks, Luigi. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody. Um, in relation to the taxation, if you can call it that, of cross-border uh, services, I, I mean, the, the, the main driver clearly is internet. Uh, if we go back 20, 30 years, uh, it would have been inconceivable uh, for a consumer based in one country to buy uh, services from a supplier established in a third country. With this trend, as Luigi has brilliantly pointed out, you know, governments, tax authorities globally identified that in order to prevent an erosion of their own domestic tax bases in relation to consumption taxes, they would inevitably have to introduce some measures, some provisions to ensure that when services were being provided cross borders, that the taxing mechanisms 
uh, should be put into place to enable uh, taxes to be collected on those services. Now, as you mentioned in our next session in April, uh, we're we'll looking at you know, this overall trend also of the servitization of the economy. Um, we'll look at you know, things like the uh, you know, inverted commas taxation of free services. You know, are those subject to consumption taxes? How do you bring those uh, transactions within in the consumption taxes net? And of course, you know, we shouldn't forget that in our discussion, uh, we're going to mostly focus down on those services which can be provided across borders. We'll focus less on those services which depend upon being supplied at a physical location, such as hairdressers, which of course is not relevant to my particular case. Um, but even with hairdressers, could we not imagine that in a future, uh, you know, uh, somebody could uh, remotely pilot a drone uh, that would actually cut your hair in a distant location and would that then not become a cross-border service um, rather than being taxed as it is today where the actual hair cutting itself takes place. All this of course is being done uh, to ensure that um, these measures are rather being adopted to ensure uh, that countries don't lose out on their taxing revenues um, creating a loss of employment in the countries of consumption uh, and in order to ensure that cross-border services uh, are not or, uh, or are effectively um, uh, taxed and are not supplied effectively tax-free. Go back uh, 30 years nearly, so beginning of the 90s, um, countries got together. Um, the major event was in Ottawa at the end of the 90s, um, where under the auspices of the OECD, a number of kind of framing principles were established as to how you know, non-established uh, businesses could be brought within the taxing net to ensure that tax revenues were still being collected where the effective consumption takes place. So these defining principles are essentially five, and we'll come back to them uh, over the course of the session today. Um, but one clear uh, point is that um, the countries, when they did uh, reach these conclusions, did come up with these five principles, they insisted that whatever measures were put into place, whatever legislation was put into place in the relevant countries, that the system should be flexible. That is, that the systems must be able to keep pace with the technological and commercial developments. Next slide. The EU was one of the first regions, if I can call it that, to uh, implement uh, effectively a taxing regime uh, to bring within the scope of European uh, consumption taxes, VAT, uh, transactions undertaken by non-established suppliers. 2002, uh, first directive uh, focused on non-EU established uh, service providers providing telecommunications, broadcasting, and electronic services uh, to final consumers, so B2C transactions, uh, all being then subject to tax uh, in the EU country in which the consumer is located. So fairly limited scope, but obviously focused down nonetheless on most of those services at the time, you know, which were being provided uh, or could be provided on a cross-border basis. Principle being, of course, is to ensure that you know, taxation was being collected or was being uh, assessed at the place of the establishment of the recipient of the services. EU uh, major region introduced uh, uh, its regime for non-EU established suppliers in the early 2000s. Uh, and clearly what we're seeing is that following that EU initiative, Many countries globally, as Luigi highlighted earlier, are following that initiative uh, and uh, introducing their own domestic regimes to enable them to collect consumption taxes uh, in relation to services provided cross-border uh, into the country in which their consumers are located. Introduction, uh, fairly slow to start with, a big uh, jump in 2015 when the EU within the EU introduced the same provisions as those that had been introduced uh, in relation to non-EU businesses uh, back in 2002, effective in 2003. But the growth, as we now see from this OECD chart, OECD chart is exponential. And there's a significant number of further countries not on the chart, which are even considering introducing 
uh, their own VAT regime. Luigi. Yeah, the, the trend is very clear. You're right, Stephen, extremely clear. And, and it is obvious that there is a growing number of jurisdictions that have implemented the OECD policy framework and a constant increase on the number of countries that are imposing VAT or GST on non-resident providers of, um, of digital services, which covers sales to consumers of all sorts of things, such as apps, e-learning, streaming media, advertising, gaming, telecoms, broadcasting services, dating sites, etc. So, for example, with effect from the 1st of January uh, 2022, so just 32 days ago, the Ukraine has also joined the club of countries imposing VAT on foreign providers of digital services, meaning that pretty much the entirety of Europe is now covered with the exception of just um, North Macedonia, Bosnia, Herzegovina, and um, and a few other smaller countries. So bear in mind that the greatest amount of uh, these countries have a nil threshold for non-residents. A, um, for example, um, an American provider of say gaming, e-learning or any other type of digital services may have VAT exposures in as many as 43 European countries, which is of course an administration headache and a risk that us as, um, as advisors of entities trading with a global audience, we must be able to manage effectively. Um, so scary stuff really, but, but things can get even more daunting when bearing in mind that when advising suppliers of digital services, we need to bear in mind the increased trend whereby exposure to indirect taxes ends up where the recipient is based as opposed to where the, 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 the supplier is located. And this is not restricted to Europe and not restricted to Europe alone. So, for example, when it comes to um, Asia Pacific, over the past five months and five months alone, uh, Pakistan, Thailand and Kazakhstan have joined the club of countries imposing VAT on foreign providers of digital services, meaning that going back to our earlier example of the American provider of gaming, e-learning, or any other type of digital services, well, this provider would have an additional VAT or GST exposure in over 20 Asia Pacific countries. And, and, and within Asia, the, the case of the city-state of Singapore is particularly fascinating. They, they introduced their own goods and services tax on non-resident providers and electronic marketplaces of digital electronic services on the, on the 1st of January, 2020. Uh, this currently applies to B2C transactions of uh, streaming music and videos of um, online gaming, e-learning apps and other um, similar services. And when it comes to B2B supplies as opposed to B2C, this should still benefit from the reverse charging provisions whereby the recipient of the services self accounts for the GST in Singapore. But there are a number of, um, of key measures that are going to be introduced within the next 11 months. Uh, this is in, like in so many other countries to ensure that a level playing field is put in place to ensure that local businesses can compete effectively and to also ensure that uh, the GST system in Singapore remains fair and resilient as the digital economy um, grows. And this might, might, might also apply to the importation of B2C non-digital services, but, but Boon will of course be best placed to go through this later on in the session also because I understand that all might change uh, when the budget is delivered um, in Singapore on Friday the 11th. Uh, sorry, Friday the 18th, I think, of, um, of February. And moving on to, um, to Africa, we have an increasing portion of the continent that has applied similar measures over the past three or four years. But I'm finding the case of South Africa of particular interest. Um, well, over there, income deriving from supplies of, of e-books, supplies of uh, e-learning, gaming, dating sites, um, gambling, downloading or streaming music and several other services is considered uh, taxable, uh, which, which is of course not a great surprise as it is perfectly in line with a considerable number 
of countries that we have analyzed over the past few minutes. But, but since a couple of years ago or so, um, and to be precise, since the 1st of January 2020, South Africa has imposed VAT obligations on non-resident providers of digital or electronic services to resident businesses, while almost all other countries tend to apply to reverse charge in such circumstances. Uh, yes, you heard it well. These measures apply to B to B supplies as well as, of course, B to C supplies. And what this means is that you might have an obligation to register for VAT in South Africa, and and penalties and interest can be draconian there. And this is uh, at the time when the South African tax authorities are increasing the focus on non-resident supplies. But luckily, we have a very very strong network of firms over there. Uh, that can help you with uh, managing the organization's risk. And taking a quick a quick look you know, higher up uh, in the map uh, at the uh, Middle East, um, Oman introduced requirements for non-resident providers of digital services from 2021. And my understanding is that Israel is also likely to do the same within the next uh, 12 months or so. And moving on to Central and South America, the greatest amount of countries are imposing consumption taxes on digital or electronic services provided by non-resident providers. And the one visible exception, and you can see it very, very clearly from, uh, from this map here, is Brazil, that has a particularly complex VAT system and is yet to implement this, um, this level playing field measures. But, but looking through the map, uh, measures have been introduced in 2020 in Bolivia, um, in El Salvador, um, in Honduras, uh, Panama, and and in Peru. Uh, so there is a there is a lot that any supplier of digital services needs to bear in mind if, if it has any clients uh, in Central or South America. And, and it is obvious that a global approach is often required when advising you, our clients, on how to minimize the risks and, uh, and maximize opportunities. And, and since this is such a key area to focus on at the moment, due to the increasing number of uh, changes, both regionally and nationally, we as, as PKF, we are we're well placed to be able to respond to your, to your requests and to proactively meet your needs. But there is... Um, there is one continent missing here, and uh, this is a continent that we, as European indirect tax advisors, we tend to find um, rather rather tricky to deal with. And North America is a bit of a, of an odd one, where Canada has just over six months ago um, imposed a five percent GST obligation on B two C foreign providers of digital or um, electronic services, but at the same time, it is also considering a 3% digital services tax for 2022. And then, and then it is actually not all uniform because individual provinces have also imposed their own sales taxes, which of course complicate matters enormously for non-resident providers of uh, digital services. Mexico did so in, um, in a rather smooth fashion and with no threshold at all with effect from June 2020, although there are some odd type of um, supplies that are not within the scope of this, such as, for example, uh, the provision of uh, e-books are not within the scope of this. But last but not least, of course, we have the uh, particularly complex case of the, uh, of the United States. And of course, there is no VAT and there is no GST system in the in the United States, but it does not mean that things are any easier for suppliers of digital or electronic services to recipients there. And this is mainly as a result of the draconian changes deriving from the Wayfair decision on remote sales tax collection, which, um, which led to 32 states out of 50 bringing non-resident providers into the tax net, but the scope and definition vary hugely. And, and these issues are affecting a great number of our clients. And this is a particularly complex area, um, so complex that uh, 
that it is best left in the hands of someone that really knows about the complexities of US sales tax and digital services. So um, over to you, Ralph. Thank you very much, uh, Luigi, and uh, good afternoon, good morning to everybody uh, on this call webinar. Yeah, um, Luigi, it was a very nice way to say that the system in the US is uh, tricky. Well, very, very often we hear from, from our clients that they are frustrated with the system in the US for a number, for a number of reasons. And um, when, when we talk about sales tax in the, in the US, uh, businesses, the first, one of the first things businesses have to keep in mind is that there is no sales tax on the federal level, um, but only on the state and local level. So that means that um, businesses have to deal with rules and regulations in 50 states and local jurisdictions as well, um, because in total there are over, over 11,000, and I repeat, over 11,000 governmental bodies that have the right to impose sales tax on products and services, which we are talking about here. So during this presentation, um, I, will, I will focus on, on some uh, high level concepts on the state level only, and uh, I will introduce them. Um, and uh, almost all states follow these concepts that I will introduce. So the first question uh, to discuss is always if the digital or the non-digital service is uh, subject to sales tax in the jurisdiction under review. If, if that's not the case, the business uh, obviously does not need to collect sales tax from the customer or even register in the jurisdiction. Um, however, if the service is subject to sales tax, the next question is about sourcing of the revenue that has been uh, generated. And that is really a quite uh, complex uh, topic and really very difficult to do sometimes because the sourcing of the revenue that has been re uh, generated by providing a digital service um, determines which state or local jurisdiction has the right to impose sales tax. And um, in, the, in, the fast few, in the past few years, we have seen changes in the way states source revenue, especially for services. For sales uh, revenue that is generated by services, whether provided in person or remotely, um, states basically use two methods to source the revenue. One method is market destination-based sourcing, meaning um, that the revenue is sourced to the location where the benefit of the services um, have been received. And the other method is performance-based sourcing, meaning uh, that the revenue is sourced to the location where the service is performed. So um, since the Wayfair decision in 2018, um, uh, many states changed the method from performance-based sourcing to market-based sourcing. And the total number of states which market-based sourcing is uh, 43 um, right now. So um, for this reason, it's really of utmost importance that businesses, uh, especially outside of the United States, are able to retrieve information in terms of where services are performed and uh, where the benefit of the service um, has been received. If it has been determined which state has the right to impose sales tax um, for remote sellers, the next step would be to review whether uh, the so-called Wayfair thresholds um, have been exceeded and a registration for sales tax uh, is required. So Wayfair thresholds, because of the Wayfair decision, most of you um, might have heard of, that uh, was uh, in 2018, where a federal law was overruled and um, a, protect, a protective uh, rule regulation was um, overruled and uh, remote sellers um, could be uh, on the hook for providing uh, services remotely or selling products remotely. So all states, meanwhile, all states with sales tax have implemented sales um, revenue and transaction thresholds, which are typically 100,000 US dollars or 200 uh, transactions. There are some um, exceptions from these uh, two numbers that I just uh, mentioned. Um, and well-known states are amongst them. Uh, New York, for example, has a $500,000 $500, threshold and is requiring 100 transactions. Uh, and California uh, on the West Coast uh, has um, also um, a sales revenue threshold of $500,000. So the main, the main challenge in, in terms of the compliance and what leads to frustration in, in, in many cases is that every state 
and local jurisdiction as well has its own rules in terms of registrations and compliance um, uh, for submitting tax returns, for example. So uh, businesses really have to make themselves familiar and uh, obviously need the help of a tax advisor to really navigate this uh, challenging landscape. And there's, there's just to, to finish this, is there is one other issue I would like to mention, which relates to corporate income tax, although this presentation is about sales tax, but these, um, these uh, rules and thresholds um, are also in place for um, corporate income tax, and the thresholds are different. And uh, although it's out of scope for this presentation, businesses with no physical presence in the US that are providing services to customers in the US need to check whether they exceed these economic nexus thresholds, which are different, as I just said, from sales tax thresholds, and they might have corporate income, stock, income tax obligations in the state um, as well. So um, on this matrix, um, I put together and it shows a selection of digital and non-digital services and whether they are subject to sales tax or not. Um, a lot of services that are historically non-digital and you see them at the at the bottom of this table uh, can, be, can be delivered as digital services now. And as of today, um, a lot of these services when provided non-digital are still not subject to sales tax. But if they are provided digitally, they are subject to sales tax, depending on what kind of uh, delivery is, is used, uh, such as software as a service, which we see a lot. So really businesses need to do a thorough analysis whether the services they provide are classified as digital or non-digital services, and more importantly, have to check the state rules. And uh, with this, um, uh, turn it over to you, Stephen. Thanks, Ralph. Um, I, I th yeah, a number of great points there. I think the first one that I kind of uh, retain is the increasing scope and increasing numbers of taxing jurisdictions, uh, you know, rendering the compliance obligations of especially non-established businesses you know, more and more complex as each day goes past. It's due in part, of course, you know, to the non-harmonization on a global basis of the taxing rules, consumption taxing rules uh, of cross-border uh, provided uh, services, uh, which can lead in certain cases to non-taxation, uh, but also cases we'll see later, um, recent European case of cases of double taxation. So on uh, a single transaction, we've ended up with tw uh, two lots of consumption taxes being due. Um, so the broadening the scope um, and inevitably um, you know, uh, countries are now looking more and more at uh, those services which historically weren't within the scope of these uh, taxing regimes uh, to bring them within the scope of their taxing regimes, in particular in the relation to the taxation of what, as Ralph mentioned, you know, uh, are, were called or are called uh, the non-digital services. Ralph, just back to you very quickly. We, you, you mentioned that you know, going into the US, there's no kind of you know, single point of entry where non-established businesses can declare all of their uh, sales taxes due in the 32 states that apply uh, uh, sales taxes uh, to distance applied services. What, what's your experience the other way around? So those US businesses are supplying you know, uh, cross-border services into say the European Union. How, yeah. how is that working? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, um, Stephen. Yeah, we see, and I think I mentioned that briefly, we, we see an increasing number of clients that provide services digitally using um, software as a service, uh, for example, and they are located in the United States. So the intellectual properties in the United States, servers are used in the United States, employees are sitting uh, in the United States, but customers are uh, all over the world. <laughs> so they are in Africa, Europe, Asia, uh, they are everywhere. And what we see is a lot of a lot of clients are not are not aware of the complications and complexities in terms of VAT in these other jurisdictions. And what we what we fear and what what, what we expect is that jurisdictions will go after these um, businesses um, in the future. And I think uh, Luigi, um, Stephen, I think you you touched that a uh, little bit. Yeah, back back to you, Stephen. 
th th thanks, thanks, Ralph. Um, we mentioned that the focus of this uh, uh, session today is very much around services, but we shouldn't forget uh, that, of course, uh, countries globally looking at the, again the potential losses of tax revenue arising from the globalization of the movement and uh, of goods uh, around the globe. Um, are looking to put into place or have put into place you know, particular regimes to ensure uh, that low value imported goods are also uh, sufficiently uh, subject to VAT. So taxation of imported low in value imported goods, clearly a very important issue for, for countries on a global basis. But how do you actually make sure that when a business is not established in the country in which the tax says or the tax is actually due, how do you make sure uh, that the tax is actually collected and remitted to the appropriate taxing authority? The OECD has been working on this this issue for some time, and you know it, it, it started very much after the discussions in Ottawa at the end of the 1990s. Um, and the OECD, in a relatively recent paper, has come up with some suggestions uh, as to how platforms playing a clearly a very key role in the distribution of the various services that consumers are now able to acquire. Uh, the role that platforms could also uh, play in terms of actually collecting the tax that's due on those underlying transactions. So the OECD, in fact, has come up with a very... You know, dramatic diagram saying that perhaps the role of platforms could range from just providing information, education, um, uh, to joint and several liability for the tax that's due on the underlying supplies, and even going as far as making the platforms actually liable for the, um, the VAT and GST liabilities. We've seen this rapid exponential growth of introduct or of new taxation systems being introduced globally the oecd is is working with accompanying countries globally to help them introduce systems which are compatible with the underlying oecd objectives and principles uh, that we've talked about earlier and in particular what the oecd has done is produce a series of digital toolkits so the idea here being is that you know, rather than each country trying to establish principle, uh, trying to establish legislation from scratch, the OECD is working alongside, working with countries to help them introduce systems which are, shall we say, OECD compatible on a global basis. So it's through digital toolkits, um, and but clearly uh, it, to ensure the most effective and efficient way of collecting the tax, uh, technology is playing a key role, and in particular, uh, the OECD has been focusing down on the Tax Administration's 3.0 project, which is a separate project OECD is working on. Within the toolkit, um, key elements, the key principles in the uh, uh, agreed in Ottawa at the back of the 1990s are, are being uh, uh, implemented in the sense of ensuring that there is as little divergence from those principles as possible. Uh, but clearly, you no, know, that is not always the case. And the um, uh, particular uh, local conditions, environment, legal frameworks have to be taken into account uh, before any uh, new taxation system can be introduced. But what is clear, though, is that there has got to be greater at a global level, and we'll talk about the EU solutions later, but at global level, there's a clear need to increase and improve uh, robust administrative cooperation. But before looking at the collection mechanisms that have been introduced on a regional basis uh, across the globe, we just perhaps need to remind ourselves of one thing, which is that generally, indirect taxes, consumption taxes are not covered in double taxation treaties. So apart from the exchange of information provisions, which we will often find in the treaties around Article 26, 27, um, most double taxation treaties you know, do not uh, deal specifically with, with indirect tax consumption taxes. As a consequence, there is nothing in those treaties which stop or prevent uh, double taxation in the consumption area or in case, certain cases, double non-taxation. So how is the, the um, 
how, you know, how do governments uh, propose to collect the taxes which are due? Well, we've seen the, uh, the EU's um, solution um, and we'll see later uh, as we go through how that is being adapted, extended um, to ensure that as many transactions as possible are collected through one single and unique mechanism. But before doing that, let's have a quick polling question to see you know, how you uh, are you know, seeing collection mechanisms operating on a global basis and taxing working uh, globally. So here's the question. We have a global software company based here in France, uh, and it provides software for a fee. Will, do you think, this company have to charge VAT, GST, or similar consumption taxes on the fees that it charges? You can tick one of the boxes, and the possible boxes are no, um, uh, it won't have to charge VAT, GST, except where the customers are located here in France. Yes, it will have to charge French VAT to all of its customers, B2C, B2B, wherever they are located in the world. Yes, it will have to charge uh, the consumption tax, but only the consumption tax of the country where the customer is established. Um, it will have to charge the consumption tax of the country where the software itself is actually used and enjoyed. Or is the answer none of those above uh, four alternatives? So uh, please vote. Uh, you can click one of the boxes and we'll see the results in about 35 seconds time. Five more seconds. Okay, let's stop the poll um, and let's see where we got to. Well, all I can conclude from the results is that the next um, 25 minutes of our session this afternoon or some morning this evening are going to be very valuable because the answer to the first polling question is that none of the above, so answer E, fifth question, uh, none of the above in fact uh, apply, uh, at least not uniquely. Uh, and I'll come on in a second to explain that particular point. So next slide, please. European Union, 1st of July, 2021, uh, expanded the one-stop shop, which existed for non-EU suppliers, electronic services, with effect from 2003, within the EU from 2015. That regime was expanded with effect from 1 July 2021 to all services. So a business established within the uh, European Union uh, can now uh, account, declare, report all the service supply within the EU on a B2C basis through one single declaration submitted to the tax authority of its member state of establishment. This extended the uh, existing regime, um, which is only limited to certain transactions, uh, which only prior to the 1st of January 2015 applied to non-EU established businesses. 1st of July 2021, um, again, the regime was extended, the reporting regime was extended to non-EU businesses, just as for EU established businesses in relation to the supplies of services. And uh, non-EU businesses can now again declare through one place of declaration, all of their transactions which are subject to VAT in any one of the 27 member states. Um, and uh, effectively, this has expanded considerably the one-stop shop regime which existed prior to that date. Going back to the question as to who actually should be collecting the tax, 
uh, that's due on these transactions. I mentioned the OECD has been working quite extensively on this, came forward with a recent paper in 2021 in relation to the gig and the sharing economy as to whether the platform should be playing a more important role in terms of the actual tax collection process. And one of the ways that this is being done is to see whether the platforms couldn't be treated as being deemed suppliers, just as was the case uh, historically for intermediaries involved uh, in transactions um, which uh, between a, an, a supplier and the final consumer, making the platform itself the one that is liable to account for the total tax due on the supply to the final consumer, even though the platform itself, its own remuneration, will only be a small percentage of the total price that's actually charged. And what we're seeing also is that this is becoming more complicated due to the, uh, uh, the introduction or the use rather in the European Union of a, a concept which has been in the VAT directive uh, since it was adopted back in 1977, the concept and notion of uh, use and enjoyment. Basically what it says, member states can, if they so wish, uh, adopt a provision which says if a transaction would otherwise be treated as being taxed outside the EU, it can be treated as being taxed within the EU if the service is enjoyed here, and vice versa. A particular problem arose in a fairly recent case that went to the European court in relation to roaming charges. This case involved the telecoms operator in South Korea, ST Telecom, and the situation was actually quite straightforward and not unusual. Um, customers of South Korea Telecom visited Austria. They used the access to the Austrian network and the Austrian network operator charged um, South Korea Telecom for the use of the Austrian network and charged the South, uh, South Korea Telecom with Austrian VAT. So the original case was all about how um, uh, SK Telecom, the South Korean company, could claim the Austrian VAT back on the roaming charges it was being charged by the, uh, the Austrian operator. But then uh, on analysis, the Austrian authorities said, ah, yes, but you can't claim the Austrian VAT back on the operator's charges to you because we, Austrian tax authorities, are of the view that you, SK Telecom, are actually you, yourself making supplies of services in Austria. So even though those services apply to South Korean customers, those services, whilst those customers were physically in Austria, accessing the Austrian network, those services were used and enjoyed in Austria. And as a consequence, Austrian VAT should be due on the roaming charges charged by SK Telecom to its customers in South Korea. The fact that this then, then led to double taxation, so both Austrian VAT and South Korean GST, was uh, a point that was reviewed, argued before the European Court, but the court said that does not matter. The fact that there is double taxation does not prevent, in this particular case, uh, Austria from claiming Austrian VAT on the roaming charges charged to customers who habitually, of course, live, reside, in a third country, South Korea. Use enjoyment is, as I say, an issue. And here are some examples very quickly. Extract, few countries, uh, not all EU 27, but you can see from this very quick chart how countries adopt, apply this use and enjoyment provision in different ways, different transactions, uh, in different circumstances. But that's enough about the European Union. Let me now hand over to Daboon for him to talk, to, to tell us about Singapore. Yeah, now um, Singapore has had GST since 1993, but with a suspended reverse charge mechanism, so it was not activated. Um, that changed in uh, January 2020 when it jumped on the bandwagon and both a reverse charge regime and overseas vendor registration regime uh, took effect. Now the overseas vendor registration regime only applies to B2C digital transactions. I see a short list over here. Now this is not a complete list, uh, but then again, um, this list is probably not particularly relevant as come uh, January, 2023. 
the overseas vendor registrations will be expanded to include non-digital services. So we'll see more of it later. Um, now, this is B2, B2B transactions. Now, this is not uh, within the scope of the overseas vendor registration as there is a reverse charge mechanism, uh, though it's probably not in the same form as most countries. It, 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 it's, I, 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 it's, it's a little bit difficult to explain over here in the short span of time, but it's, um, it's a modified version. Now, there is a surprisingly low threshold of $100,000. Uh, it was low to me, but I do understand from some of my colleagues that actually it's, it's not low um, in the other parts of the world. Now, budget 2021 actually expanded the overseas vendor registration to include non-digital services. Now, this is actually not surprising. If you think about it, technology has become a facilitator and it actually allows for some traditional non-digital services, um, for example, legal advisory or examination services to be delivered cross jurisdiction painlessly. So the definition actually has been expanded to uh, and renamed remote services, which is roughly defined to include uh, services where at the time of performance of the service, there is no necessary connection between the physical location of the recipient and the place of the physical performance. Um, but budget 2022, which is going to happen on 18 of February, just a couple of days later, um, we are expecting to see new changes. Uh, if anybody is interested in the full list of the included or excluded services, um, it, it is available upon request. And uh, yeah, lastly, the removal of exemption on uh, low value imports. I think this is not, actually not surprising. That's actually a trend that we see in uh, many other countries. Um, yeah, so that's the update we have for Singapore. And then after, after Singapore and uh, last but not least, the, uh, the UK, which of course introduced the um, VAT obligations on non-resident providers and marketplaces of electronic or digital services to consumers all the way back on the 1st of January 2015. Now, this, this was, of course, um, as part of the EU's mini one-stop shop uh, reporting regime. And the UK has, of course, left this regime at the end of uh, 2020 with the ending of its Brexit transition period. And the formalities have changed. Uh, the, the processes have changed. But much of the substance remains the same, meaning that foreign providers generally must register with HMRC in the UK when selling e-services locally. One thing that is crucial is that uh, there is no VAT registration threshold available for overseas providers, meaning that a provider must register immediately as soon as it makes its first supply to a UK recipient, never mind, never mind how small um, that might be. And looking at the bright side, it is also worth bearing in mind that there is no requirement for a non-resident provider to appoint a fiscal representative in the United Kingdom. And, and earlier on in this webinar, I mentioned how, you know, we, we have a, a big question mark, a big global question mark on what actually constitutes a, uh, a digital supply. And the good news is that despite having left the European Union, the UK actually still follows the broad new definition of telecommunication, broadcast, and electronic supplied um, services for uh, VAT. And this includes income from services, including broadcast radio and TV, which of course includes uh, live streaming, uh, fixed and mobile voice and data telecom, which of course includes internet access, um, voice over IP services, images, PDFs, messaging, photos, and uh, similar types of uh, supplies, streaming of global media, uh, ebooks, gambling, online journals, uh, website supply or hosting, advertising on websites, cloud, or, or other type of uh, download software. And, and all the other um, usual suspects, uh, such as, for example, um, dating sites. And let's also bear in mind that when it comes to B2B supplies of digital services, when non-resident providers of digital services supply to UK resident businesses, they should not charge UK VAT. And instead, 
they should zero rate the invoice under the reverse charge rules and allow the UK customer to report the transaction to HMRC through the reverse charge. And it is also worth bearing in mind that any non-resident supplier of B2B digital services supplying these to UK businesses will not, of course, be entitled to register for UK VAT, not even on a voluntary basis, unless, of course, they're also making other types of supplies or could register because of other um, types of factors. And then when it comes to supplies that can register for UK VAT, uh, for example, because they make B2C supplies of digital services, it is worth bearing in mind how the UK does not provide a simplified digital services registration process, meaning that registrations can actually take quite some time, uh, even as long as um, four to six weeks over here. But on the flip side of the coin, this means that any input VAT incurred in the UK can actually be um, reclaimed in the normal way. So although doing business in the UK, at least for European businesses, is now not quite as straightforward as it used to be. The new additional barriers that have been put in place since the UK has left the EU should actually not be a reason for you not to service this market. And uh, at PKF, we certainly have the expertise to ensure that you can do so with as little disruption as possible. And during this short session, we, we raised a number of significant risks, both opportunities for, for your business. And the risks can be minimized as far as possible and the opportunities exploited as far as possible when ensuring that the business models are reviewed nice and early to ensure that our team of indirect tax practitioners throughout the globe can put in place strong argumentation relying on principles of law, which as discussed over the past 57 minutes or so um, are constantly evolving. It is therefore essential whenever whenever your organization wishes to enter um, a foreign market, or even just to, to supply services to, to an entity or a private individual abroad, it is essential that you carry out an indirect tax analysis early and consider um, compliance requirements. And as a network, we are we're in a particularly good position. We have, we have strong indirect tax presence in all member states, and uh, we tend to work very closely with direct tax practitioners, meaning that an initial assessment should really never be more than just a short telephone conversation away. And, and I hope that you found this session helpful. And, and I guess that with only, um, let's say five minutes to go, and this is because the referee has indicated a minimum of three minutes of additional time, um, and now it is probably a good time to leave the mic to Stefan, who I understand has been um, collecting some questions. Yes, thank you, Luigi. Indeed, we received a number of questions. And maybe I can start off with a very uh, general one. One of the attendees asked if the um, if they can receive the, the slides after the presentation. Now, the presentation is being recorded and will be available on diverse platforms like uh, YouTube. But of course, you're free to reach out to any of the uh, panelists uh, through the respective member firms or on LinkedIn. We're all on LinkedIn. And I'm sure we can uh, provide you with a, a PDF version of the uh, slides that were shown today. Um, Luigi, uh, a first question that came in. Um, I run a US company with no nexus in Europe and provide consultancy services to individuals that enjoy these in Italy. I understand that I'm liable to register for VAT in Italy. Would you be able to do this for us? Of course we can. Um, well, I could certainly uh, take responsibility for dealing with your exposures in Italy, but, uh, but despite my, um, my, my name, uh, despite my surname, and despite my very, very strong Italian accent, I'm actually not an Italian indirect tax advisor, uh, but just a UK chartered tax advisor. And, uh, and at PKF, we actually strongly believe that the work should always be carried out by those that really know what they're doing. And we have um, a fantastic team in Italy and some extremely 
knowledgeable in their tax advisors, such as Matteo Macho, uh, such as uh, Barbara Pollicina and uh, Stefano Quaglia, who is an authority in the world of Italian VAT. But going back to, um, to the question, Stefan, you mentioned that this is a US company with no fixed establishment, no nexus in, uh, in, in Italy, providing B to C advisory services to um, individuals in Italy, right? And, um, and I'm actually not too convinced that the, uh, the company of our, um, of our listener, of our viewer, um, has actually an obligation to register for VAT in Italy, as, um, as Italy does not apply the optional effective use and enjoyment criteria when it comes to consultancy services. Certainly, certainly France does, certainly Sweden does, and there must be some additional member states also, but I, I'm not too sure whether Italy is actually one of them. But that's, that's why um, we should always rely on people that actually know what they're doing. So I can probably ask Matteo, or I could ask Barbara, or I could ask Stefano, um, just give me an hour or so and I will be able to get back to our viewer based in, uh, in the US. But my feeling is that, is that uh, the US company is actually unlikely to have an exposure in Italy as a result of uh, these uh, B2C consultancy supplies. Okay, brilliant. Uh, we received another question. I think this one uh, can be answered by Stephen perhaps. Uh, most VAT reporting mechanisms to report consumption taxes on cross-border supplies of services are payment-only mechanisms, as for example in the EU. Uh, so Stephen, can you get any locally incurred VAT back where you are registered under the Union OSS or non-Union OSS in the EU? Thank you, Stefan. Um, the, the answer is in principle, yes, uh, subject to the rules in the local country as to what is recoverable VAT or what is not. Um, but because at the moment, uh, the OSS and the non-union OSS mechanisms are payment only mechanisms, there is no offset against the tax that's due in those countries uh, by the input VAT that's deductible in those countries. I say at the moment because the European Commission is looking at expanding the OSS such that a, an offset of the input tax in the future might be possible. But today, no. Uh, and refund claims by non-established businesses have to be done either through the 2008-9 directive for EU companies or for non-EU companies through the uh, EC's 13th VAT directive. Thank you, Stefan. Okay. Thank you, Stephen. Um... Another more general question that came in, what about PE, permanent establishment from a VAT perspective, as it has become a gray area based on recent ECJ cases, but I think this will be addressed on the 6th of April, right? Correct. The 6th yeah. of April is going to be dedicated pretty much solely okay. to that. So okay, so make sure you're there if you're interested in that topic. Um, a final question, perhaps, uh, in the interest of time, because we're running a bit over time. I can see a question has come in from a former PKF colleague here. Um, as you mentioned, each country that implements the rules for digital services may have specific requirements. The trickiest one is the level of the human intervention. If the rules are newly introduced, we don't expect so much experience of the tax authorities with this. How can we decide if our products are seen as digital and how does the human intervention impact the digital or non-digital nature? Anyone uh, care to uh, answer that? Or I mean, it's a long question. We can also uh, individually come back to this uh, person, I guess. Uh, Maybe maybe I can I have uh, saw, thought about this. I think maybe it's it's really about how how is the service delivered, the way of delivery, and I, I think I mentioned earlier uh, software as a service as one of the examples. That's one of the three ways for uh, for cloud computing, which is used right infrastructure, platform, or software as a service. So I would say tax authority. And that's what what uh, states do in the United States. They look at the way a service. Um, is being provided by using these technical um, uh, 
by using these cloud computing, um, uh, um, by, by using cloud computing, right? Like like the software as a service. I think they, they will focus on that. Yeah. Okay. That's what Thank I think. You. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Ralph. Um, well, maybe a bit more time for, for some questions. Um, are services of price comparison websites considered as electronic services? Uh, maybe you can take that one, Luigi. Um, well, I, I guess that the nature of services provided through price comparison websites are normally um, automated with the with very little, well, with no human intervention at all, going back to the question that was actually asked earlier on, meaning that, meaning that normally the services should be qualified as electronic services. And uh, that must be the case in the greatest majority of jurisdictions, certainly in all the 27 member states, certainly in the UK. And I very much think that uh, that will be in the greatest majority of jurisdictions worldwide that apply principles which are similar to those applied um in uh, in europe but th this question may actually be a lot simpler uh, than you might expect stefan and um and that is because we actually act for um for a great number of price comparison websites and i tend to find um that the key question that you need to ask yourself is whether the price comparison services provided to the to the final consumer are actually supplied for consideration. And when these are provided to the final consumer for free, so with no payment whatsoever, which I believe is normally the case, uh, that particular service falls outside the scope of VAT, meaning that there is uh, there are no obligations for the providers of uh, price comparison services. No. Okay. Well, now that we're on it, uh, a final question that, that came in. Um, Maybe you can provide us with a short answer. We are an international business and purchase web hosting services through our US parent company. These services are utilized by the whole business, which includes branches in the UK and in the EU. The provider of the services is based in the US. Is there anything to consider in this case? Uh, there's actually quite a lot to consider in relation to this. And then of course we'll be running some of the main points uh, during our webinar on the uh, 6th of April, uh, when we'll be looking into this uh, concept of uh, fixed establishment. But in the meantime, specifically relevant to the question of our uh, um, viewer, we of course know that web hosting services are clearly within the scope of BTE services, um, which stands for Broadcasting Telecommunication Electronic um, Services. So. We should assume that from a BAT perspective, that the services are used and enjoyed partly in the UK and are used and enjoyed also partly in other EU branches that uh, were mentioned in the question. So we, we would first need to determine how much in percentage terms those web hosting services are used by the UK branch. And we'll then need to apply the very same approach for the other um, European branches as well. And going back to the UK, if the business determines that, let's say, 10% of the service are used by the UK branch, 10% of the consideration falls within the scope of UK VAT under the uh, use and enjoyment provisions, and the very same approach will then need to be carried out in relation to the other um, EU branches. Yeah. It's 90 minutes of additional time now. Okay. Thank you, Luigi. So uh, this concludes our uh, Q&A session for today's webinar. Thank you for the questions sent through. We will also conduct a short survey after this event, uh, which will be anonymous, by the way. And don't worry, it will take less than two minutes uh, to complete. Before we end today's session, we would like to draw your attention to some of the free tax resources which we have available. You can access these by visiting our PKF International website at www.pkf.com. On our website, you will also be able to locate the closest PKF firm within your city for assistance with any indirect tax challenges that you might be facing. For your convenience, you can search by country, city, uh, keywords, or use our world map to search by region. On behalf of today's panel, I would first like to thank all of you for joining us today globally. I would also like to thank all of the presenters for their hard work. 
the fourth session of our global indirect taxes series, the servitization of the economy and the importance of establishments will be hosted on the 6th of April, 2022. You can register for this event through our website, pkf.com or email events at pkf.com. That is events at pkf.com for the registration information. Also keep an eye on PKF International social media pages like LinkedIn, Facebook and Twitter for the registration information of these upcoming events. In the meantime, be well and stay safe and we hope to see you in our next PKF virtual event.